Welcome everyone to tonight's episode of Profound States. My uh, guest is Lada Leon, who has been clinically dead three times and has experienced a completely different type of NDE. She's had many OBEs and had a pre-birth memory of being shown the nature of this facsimile reality and the nature of the trap and battle here. La uh, Lada, thank you so much for joining me and welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So, um, you were born in what city, in what state? You were born in Canada? No, actually, born in Spain. In what city? Madrid. Okay. And so, uh, how far does your memory go back in your life? M mine generally stops, starts around the age of four or five. How far do you go? Before I was born. Okay, so you remember the moment of your birth, actually? Uh, everything, every everything. detail. Okay, so if we get, went back uh, before your birth, how far can you go back in contiguous time without any... You weren't mind wiped? You, you remember no. everything? Okay. I wouldn't say I remember everything. I remember a large amount. Um, but I think like certain details of certain things I don't have. But I remember many lifetimes. I remember being in different places. I remember being prepared for coming in here specifically for what what's coming. And that's the purpose of why I came in. So I was being briefed and I was being prepared. And then I remember being escorted down here. <laughs> And then I remember the birthing process. So uh, who was it that briefed you? Uh, who briefed me was, I mean, I haven't come out with a lot of this material because it is in my book. So there's just a, parts of it that I just don't want to get into because I haven't made it publicly known yet. But let's just say it's the highest celestial realm. And okay. this, you know, the preparation that was being done, it was with others as well. Like, I know that there were others there. And we were being shown critical information about the things that were going to be happening here and what we were coming in for. And we all volunteered. We all um, came in from different parts of the universe for specific reasons. And um, and then I was uh, stalling because I was really starting to wonder if we could do this. Because it's the most difficult thing to do is coming down here. And um, and then there's the, the fear of the trap. So there was a lot of um, preparation around not falling asleep and making sure you wouldn't get trapped so you wouldn't stay stuck. Uh, so there was a lot of worry. Like I was like, oh, can we do this? This is like Mission Impossible on steroids. And um, I was asking a lot of questions and I was stalling and I didn't realize, but I guess apparently the baby was already born um, that I was going into. And I was still uh, up there asking a lot of questions. And, you know, I mean, it was it was considered one of the most difficult things to do in the universe is coming in here. So there were a lot of beings from all over the universe there to witness that. Um, but when I was stalling, the baby had already been born. So that was a, a stillbirth. And uh, and then I was escorted quickly down into the body of the baby that was already born. So I, I remember the entire thing. I remember it was very painful because we had to go at a very high velocity. And they said, this is going to hurt. And they were correct. And I remember seeing all, everything all the way down into the birth of the, the child. and when we finally got close to it, the impact of me going into the body of that little baby was so severe 
that the whole body of the baby raised itself up from the table and came back down, which is, and then, you know, which was me entering and then screaming. So, um, was your early childhood as odd as the rest of your life? I mean, has every bit, every moment of your life every been moment. strange? Every bit of it is strange, which I was prepared for. I was told about it. What's the, what's the first really odd thing that, I mean, maybe it's not odd for you because you've experienced these things so many times, but for the rest of us, what an average person would consider odd, what was the first event in your life that the most people would consider odd that you well, remember? I mean, the first thing that was odd was coming into this density and dealing with just how heavy it is and painful. Like it, it's a very heavy density here that is really foreign and really uncomfortable. Well, okay, so okay, so all right. Uh, My was so go back, go back when it wasn't this way. You had, if you think this is uh, heavy density. Yeah. Go back to when it wasn't, when you're, when your life before you were born, mm -hmm. when you were in a place where it wasn't like it is now. Right. Tell us about the lack of density. Well, you still have a body. You're still physical. You're just not, uh, there's no pain. You have most of all of your meta abilities already functioning. You're, um, you're much lighter you're vibrating at a very high speed. So there is a frequency vibration that your body uh, functions in. So that's the norm. And that's kind of like a really high density light frequency. So you're talking about between an incarnation. Yeah, well, that's what I'm just talking about my body before coming in here. But I, see, when I asked that question, I, I was assuming you would talk about a particular place of some type, you know, where whether it's heaven or another oh. planet or somewhere that, you know, it, rather than a state of being, I assumed you would come up with a an actual place that you were at. Well, I was in Lemuria. Ah, and in incarnation, yeah. Yeah, and uh, that was also very light, like that was light density when Lemuria was happening. That was also a very a much lighter density. So I can, you know, talk about that. And we were functioning very similarly to what I'm explaining before coming in here. The bodies were much more um, emanating a light also, emanating like a, a mild light because you're, you're spinning at a very high velocity. And that high velocity allows you to do things like bilocate and things like that. So in Lemuria, we were able to do a lot of things. So what what was your purpose uh, for your life in Lemuria? Why, why did you live that life? I, when I was there, I was dealing mostly with um, restructuring and in, uh, what do you call it? Like stargates, if you will, alignments celestial alignments with Terra. So many of us in Lemuria were working with a harmonic and the harmonic was for, um, it isn't like the life of evil or anything like that, that started coming in and, and creating density. It was prior to that. So we were forming harmonics so that people were able to be and function in harmony with the cosmos and create and experience creation, right? So you're experiencing creation within a body, but you're able to connect celestially. And so the event you keep referring to, and I've heard you speak about it on your videos too. What is the upcoming event that you refer to? Yeah. Uh, can you describe it? The convergence of the event horizon is really what's going to undo all of this, right? It's basically 
Um, in the past, we've had massive resets, right, that are akin to uh, magnetic reversals. But and they are they are types of convergences. But the convergence we're headed into, which is called a convergence of the event horizon, is is really to finish with this imbalance that has happened as a result of too much evil, which is imbalancing the universe. And at this point, it can't be allowed to continue. So when the convergence is complete, you are gonna see a magnetic reversal, but you're also gonna see everything going supernova because it is really about the creation of the new universe. As that is being created, this one is being destroyed. So, so you you were shown that before you came here. Yep. And I was given that name in that celestial realm that it's called the convergence of the event horizon. And what's before? How um, how long does it take for the convergence to occur from the from the moment that it is? Um, let's say you know, very, extremely obvious to the moment it has fulfilled itself and the change has been made. How long of a time frame is that? You could say that we're experiencing a lot of the symptoms already that is, is driving us toward that end right now. And we've been experiencing that since 2009. Um, and, you you know, those are the more serious escalating um things but the past 2000 years is really when it really started so within 2000 years you can see different waves happening to get us closer to it now since 2009 we're there like we are going through the major aspects of it and this will keep escalating until it's completed so what's the what's the next uh, symptom that is kind of you know off the charts or sort of more obvious than anything we've gone through so far? Well, you're going to be seeing more and more natural catastrophes. They're going to uh, ramp up. What you're seeing is is that these things are escalating more and more. So you're seeing that earthquakes are happening more volcanoes happening more, that's just going to keep going until it gets stronger and stronger and stronger until you get multiple things happening at the same time. So, you know, right now we're experiencing an earthquake here, a volcano there. You're going to start seeing these things connecting and happening more at the same time. And you're going to see more of them, multiple ones happening at the same time. So as we get nearer to it, we're getting closer to that occurrence happening. But you're also seeing things happening with the sun and the uh, core of this realm. The internal core is reacting differently. You're going to be seeing more and more things happening with the magnetosphere and the heliosphere is starting to wane. It's starting to flux. It's starting, it's starting to weaken. And the sun is going to go whiter and whiter because the closer you get to the convergence, the whiter the sun gets. The more piercing it gets, it's going to get hotter and hotter and hotter. You know, so we're just. It, it, think of it as a well, I hate to use this, but the frog in boiling water. So do you think uh, most humans will pass long before this occurs? A lot will. Um, by choice, because they just don't want to have to go through this. So there is, like, definitely mammals also in the ocean are starting to go prior to this. Mammals on land, um, you're seeing large, large quantities exiting. I mean, you're also seeing people exiting because of what's been done, you know, with the elixir. And that's different, but you are going to be seeing you know, there's going to be certain effects happening the more that these 
greater things start to make themselves known. It's going to have an effect on people's brains. And if there's like issues there, it's going to be more difficult to deal with it. So some will have heart attacks instantly. Like a lot of that will happen actually. Um, some won't be able to deal with the heat, the, the heat that's coming. Um, so yeah, there's going to be waves and waves of people exiting before it happens, but you're also going to be seeing people. Um, I have been shown that people will be removed also in body to the new earth prior to this happening. So there will be a lot of people being removed as well. So what is your, you were born for that convergence. What is your role in the convergence? Well, you know, you're not allowed to know everything. You're, you know, that you're not going to be here given everything you want to know. You're just going to be told what you need to know. So when the time comes, you'll be told. Yeah, or yeah. not, or I'll just do what I'm doing and continue doing it. And then it'll be like done and that's, yeah, I'll figure it out then. So you've had... Uh, how many NDEs? Three? No, actually more. <laughs> how many NDEs have you had? NDEs have you had? Uh, I've had six. Okay. Do you mind going through all six? How, how quickly can you go through all six? Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot. Um, I mean, the first one was when I was a baby. Uh, not the stillborn. Not the stillbirth, because I wasn't in the body. Like, I didn't enter until the end there. But... No, I was allergic to all human food when I came in. I couldn't, my body could not do anything with any of the food here. So <clears throat> that was my first experience with death and coming back. I was in a strange kind of a coma that wasn't technically a coma. Well, um, within the ease, I guess most people are not so much interested in why or how you died, but mm. what it was like on the other side when you were over there. So if you could go through as much of these six as you can with an emphasis on what it was like over there on the other side, that would be cool. Right. Yeah, my experiences were never like, oh, you know, there's a light there and there's people waiting for you. It was never like that. It was it was always connected to going and returning back to the deep. So and and going into the deep in different, you know, each time that I died, I would go to the deep. But each time I would be in the deep, I would be shown different things. And sometimes I wouldn't be shown anything. It would just be me in the deep and knowing that everything was externally detached. So. so when you say the deep, you mean uh, the void. It's not really a void. A void is no is nothingness. The deep is everything. It's just completely the blackest black you can imagine, where there's no no light whatsoever. This just absolute. People call it the void. That confuses me because I have gone to the artificial void, and that is a void. That is an emptiness, and that place is scary. But the deep is like the is it's like the place of your primordial essence where you're essentially everything and nothing at the same time so it it has like the greatest peace it's really the place where creation became the spark of creation coming out of the deep so it is it is to me the place that everybody stems from Whereas the void is an emptiness. You don't feel empty in the deep. You feel a peace like you've never felt and a completion. Like it's, it's a completeness. Everything in existence that ever was is, is a part of the consciousness. But that takes you back to the beginning of creation prior to being created so you heard a lot of other people's ndes right i wouldn't say a lot but yeah quite quite a few 
OK, so have you ever heard anybody talk about the deep besides you? Um, I have had clients come to me saying that they, after seeing the videos, that they've had similar experiences. Sounds Not me, like I think maybe three people. So you mean in person you met them? Yeah. And they said they had gone to the deep. That they had similar experiences. Yeah. Did they say anything about it that was different than you experienced? Um, no, not really. I, because what they experienced also was the greatest peace that they've ever felt. And your mind logically doesn't go there when you first enter the deep because you're still connected to like the corporeal experience and things, right? So initially, and they and they had the same thing happen. Initially, you panic because you're, you know, you've been told that you're going to see the light or you're going to have people waiting for you and none of that happens. So initially they panicked because they didn't understand where they were until they allowed themselves just to be there and feel everything. The one, the one was interesting because she had said the same thing that I experienced in one of my deaths where I was magnetically pulled back. And she had the, the exact same thing happen. And as far as I know, those are we're the only two that speak about that magnet, that magnetic um, pull that happens where you are brought back in through this magnetic force out of the deep. So you mean you mean pull pull back to life? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's like this magnet that comes in and just you can't see anything. It's like all, but you just feel like this magnet sticks and then you're being pulled back in. To life. Yeah. So did you go anywhere else besides the deep when you were on the other side? Yeah, there was, um, there was a couple of them that were different uh, where one of them I was traveling through many galaxies and going, going, going all over the place, experiencing one galaxy after the other, after the other. And then there was a huge war that was taking place where I was being attacked by entities that are in those, you know, they're there. And I had, um, I had like a, an entire team of beings coming in to fight this fight to get me into safety because I, at the beginning, was alone with these creatures and they were trying to kill me. And when I say kill, because I'm already dead in the body, right, physically, but they're actually trying to kill my essence there. Your soul. Or your... And then when that happened, uh, it was like a um, colossal war. It was this huge war. This entire group of beings, which were like celestial warriors, came in to fight the battle. And then I was taken by them back in escorted again and um I, apparently i went too far because even though my body died i was still connected my cord was still connected so even though i was you know technically dead i was still connected by the cord but they were you know the fight that was happening they were also trying to cut the cord and they said if the cord was cut i wouldn't be able to go back into my body so, sure. So, okay. so that one was. I've had a lot of like, you know, I've had six deaths, but you know, there was another one that happened where I went to Saturn, <laughs> and it was very interesting because I was uh, connected to Saturn, could hear the. Um, I guess you can call it the music of Saturn. And I couldn't figure out why I was visiting Saturn. It was like I was really trying to figure it out. Um, but that was, you know, another experience. And that, I think, has to do with, like, Saturn being a principality that has a lot of rulership over this reality. And it was a part of the machine. So that was 
you know, interesting. The other one I had was um, I was taken to the ring, the, the bells of Earth, like the ring bells of Earth. So Earth has this beautiful ring. It sounds like a bell that it does. And it does this like nonstop. And as one ring happens, it kind of goes into, it just sounds like it goes into eternity and it just keeps continuing to sound. I don't know how to explain it. Um, and now, so I was taken into that field of the bells of earth and um, almost didn't come back actually. Did you enjoy it? It was so beautiful. It was so, so beautiful and peaceful. And the sound of that bell that Earth makes is one of the most beautiful sounds I've ever heard. And they had a really hard time getting me back. So the, go back for a moment to the, um, the uh, time when the entities were attacking you. So people talk about the earth plane, the astral plane, and then some people talk about the, the other planes of duality, causal, mental, etheric, and so forth, uh, um, beyond the astral plane. And so when the entities were attacking you, do you know where, what plane of existence or where that was? Do you have any a name for it? Okay, what I saw was we were surrounded by galaxies. So it felt very physical, though I wasn't in this kind of a body. I had my body. And I, you could say it was your etheric body, but it was quite physically etheric. So we were, if you will, in space or whatever the space is between these galaxies that are very physical so it's not just etheric because there is an etheric body an actual physical etheric body which is what it felt like it was very physical the battle was very physical just not this kind of physical okay so um you've had a lot of out-of-body experiences right yeah, I couldn't stay in my body for a long time. <laughs> so that uh, was one of the that was one of the things that happened coming in the way I came in with the kind of knowledge that I came in with. I couldn't really stay in the body. In the body, I had to acclimate to the body, but I was still spinning at a higher frequency, so I couldn't really stay in this body and I kept I kept leaving my body all the time. Like all the time. And I used to have things that were like similar to seizures. I had a lot of weird symptoms that were associated with this. So, you know, I would go unconscious if you touched my back. Um, I had these strange type of seizures, which were not, um, you know, I was taken to hospital, all that kind of stuff where they're trying to research and see what's wrong with you. And um, it was not epilepsy. It was not anything that they could, they couldn't figure it out. But, um, you know, I had, I had like symptoms of overstimulation from a different kind of, you know, body that I couldn't get used to. So overstimulation because I heightened senses, heightened abilities. And then, yeah, so I had a lot of weird little symptoms that were just a part of my life. And people couldn't touch me because then I'd go unconscious. And I would like drop unconscious, like instantly. So there were a lot of strangeness, right? So how many times would you say you've been out of your body in your lifetime? Just, just ballpark. Thousand, 10,000, <laughs> a couple hundred, 50,000. Uh, just too many to remember, right? So, yeah. I, I mean, it was, a, it was an issue. It was an issue big time because I thought if I keep going like this, um, I am going to lose connection to my body. 
So when you were out of your body, do you remember most of those, the, the actual out of body, that part of the experience? Sure. I mean, I would just go check out whatever I wanted to go see. I'd go out of my body all the time at school and I would just go and check out what the principal was doing. I'd go check out what other teachers were doing. I'd go, you know, all over the neighborhood. I would just go wherever I wanted. <laughs> How, what's the furthest you ever went when you're out of your body? Ooh, uh, galaxies. And what did you do when you say galaxies? You went to other galaxies. Okay, so. I, I, you, you get in trouble for doing that, by the way. Uh, you get in trouble by who? Yeah, the, the, there's a lot of celestial guardian beings that, you know, because I would do this, I would end up going and, and finding myself traveling and going further and further, but you can only go so far before your cord snaps off. And you have a, a silver cord that is connected to your body and your soul, your spirit, whatever you are in that ethereal body. There is an actual cord. If you go too far, you snap that off. You're not coming back. So I learned that the hard way because I would go <laughs> gallivanting all over the place. And I'd be going way too far. So I'd always have these celestial beings that come in and just give me heck. Like, you know, you're not supposed to, you can't go out this far. You know, if this snaps, like they were mad. If this snaps, that's it. You're, you know, you're, you're not down there anymore. And so I had to really curb that. And, and yeah. Can you, can you describe one of these celestial beings? Um, ginormous ginormous titan beings um filled with light very human looking but beautiful white silver hair long um like you could say they look like they didn't always you know there's i know that there's many that have wings but they didn't necessarily have wings they were just these warrior celestial beings that had swords and they had armor, <laughs> like, they were massive and absolutely stunning, radiating light. And some of them had copper skin, so like a darker skin. It wasn't like they were always white. They were like this copper-esque color, beautiful, stunning eyes, just stunning. Yeah, just stunning beings. So of all the experiences you've had within your current incarnation, what's the most interesting thing you've ever experienced in this uh, incarnation? What event? Hmm. Wow, God. That's a really hard question for me because there's just been so many experiences that I've had. Um, it's like the... Well, you know what, there, when I was a teen, this is only one of them because I don't have just one, but when I was a teenager between the ages of, um, I'd say about 16 and 20, I was taking, I was taken to the lands outside of the um, ice wall, the continents. So I was taken <laughs> to be shown all of these continents in this realm that are outside the ice wall. And it's completely different weather. It's beautiful. There's tons and tons of these continents, and each continent is like its own civilization, its own um, world, really. And there's many, many, many. I was taken there a few times. And that's when I was like, wow, man. So Earth as we know it is just only one tiny aspect that's cut off from the rest. So talk about the ice wall. Well, the ice wall is this huge ice wall that basically keeps us in a containment system to make us think that Earth as we know it with the continents that we know are, are the entire Earth. And all I can say is being taken to these other continents, that's not so. But the Earth as we know it, so the continents of our Earth as we know it, um, 
it's surrounded by a huge ice wall that is really kind of uh, impenetrable unless you go underneath, uh, which, you know, I know the government accesses that underneath the ice walls. Or, you know, apparently later on in my life, I found out about Admiral Byrd, who apparently flew over the ice wall and was brought into one of these continents um, or one of these worlds over the ice wall. So I think there's been some, maybe I don't know how many, some beings who've managed to go there and they were sanctioned to do it. Um, but it's pretty much off limits. You're not getting over there, like unless they want you over there. Well, um, so if if there's a satellite in space, it mm -hmm. obviously is not going to see the ice wall, correct? Well, it should see the ice wall if they let you see it. So you're saying that they're the ice walls, whatever that is, is that a construct on the Earth or around the Earth, beyond the Earth? No, it's around the Earth. It's literally around, and it keeps all those other worlds outside. So think of Earth as larger. It's a larger realm and massive with many... The size of Earth as we know it with, you know, Australia, North America, South America... Europe, just think of that all together and add more continents. Just pretend that there's a big wall surrounding that entire area where our Earth continents are. And you could see the ice wall. You should be able to see the ice wall from the satellites, but will they let you see that? You know, I know that there's pictures out there of the ice wall that people have taken, but I think they control what you see through the satellites and they don't want anyone knowing but if you know when I was studying I study the moon all the time and when I was looking at the moon taking pictures and and going in to see what I could see it looks like the moon is a a mirror projection copy of of this realm so you can see all the continents of earth on the moon that's what you're looking at when you see those shapes Plus, you see all the other continents on the other side. You actually see that on the moon. That's what I, you know, could see from the pictures. It's perfect outline of the continent of the continents of our Earth, plus these continents I am speaking of, which I didn't know until I was taken there. So, and different beings that are there, and you're talking about, I, you know different civilizations, different beings, like it's it's an entire universal system of different. So if the earth is round, it, how does the ice wall block off everything if the earth is round and the wall is? Um, I don't know if the earth is round. So I think the toroidal field makes it look like the earth is round, but I'm not sure the earth is round. So you're saying when we see a picture of the Earth from the moon and it looks like it's round, you're saying that's not real? Well, it looks like that's a projection, mirror projection of here. Like somehow it's mirroring, projecting what, what we look like from there. I don't think the moon is what we think it is or what we've been taught to believe it is, but it seems to be like an image of all of this because you can see the continents of earth on the moon and you can see all the other continents that i'm speaking of that are beyond the ice wall so i think the concept of earth being round i'm not sure it's round so what are, what is in the continents beyond the on the other side that you speak of all different kinds of civilizations of beings, different beings, like alien beings. This may be where we get a lot of our alien visitors that come here, because I do believe a lot of it is interdimensional. 
But I'm thinking, well, you know, I think a lot of them are from over there and they each have each continent would be equivalent to an earth in, in size or what we know of. It's huge. It's just so much bigger than what we think. So you're looking at different beings, different races, different uh, what we would call alien, right? So what um, what different races have you had direct contact with within your current incarnation? I've had contact with many, 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 many kinds, many. I don't forgot with the list. You know, I think the Nordics kept coming like these. What they look like super Nordics, the Pleiadians have come, reptilians, the Drach. Um, I've, I've got crystal beings that came. I've got greys. Um, there's just so many kinds of beings, the blue beings. Um, I've had beings come to me that I don't even know what they are. They're like the weirdest. Uh, you know, be kind of beings. I don't know what they are, they're, but they're a lot of fun. You know, I've met beings that are not traditionally like us. There's no arms and legs and they don't have the same features as we do. And they're very, but they're incredibly high vibration and they communicate. So you do know what they're feeling and you do, they communicate through feeling these ones in particular, I'm thinking of, but yeah, so I've I've met with many. I've met with dark ones too. Like there's a lot of uh, alliances vying for us that are trying to hide and masquerade what they're connected to. So many of these kind um, will look very beautiful and enticing, and that's part of the appeal to seduce people. Discovering that, you know, many of those are actually have these agendas that are not for our own good. I've met Andromedans. I've met, um, yeah, like I, I've met so many different kinds. So talk about some of the most, uh, the top two or three or five or six uh, experiences you've had with aliens. Well, okay, so I met, I'm, didn't have a lot of experiences with this kind of a being, but it was probably a, one of the most profound experiences. And they have a crystal here in, inside. Like it's, you can see the crystal, but it's a part of their body. And the crystal is where the third eye would be. And they communicate through telepathy, but there's, so much coming through the crystal when it, you connect with it. And these beings can show you through the communication and through the crystal, they can sort of show you like 3D reality of a lot of things that have happened throughout, you know, millions of years. So that was probably an incredible experience I've had with those kind of beings. Um, and what did they show you? Well, they showed me they showed me the evolution of Earth to a point of Terra, explosions, wars, um, bodies of these uh, that created worlds, like bodies of these beings that were destroyed through battles, that those pieces of the body created worlds. And um, showed me some things about their world. Um, really it, it all can't, comes down to like working to try and get information that war has to stop because it's, it's essentially tipping the scales to a point that there's no return. They're very interested in, in preserving life. They're interested in preserving humanity because inside humanity, there's every kind of being in there. It's like a massive universal galactic map. That is uh, apparently one of the most precious things in the universe. So, you know, they're very concerned about that. They're very concerned about this energy tipping the scales. 
because they were showing me how it's impacting all these other worlds. So, you know, we think in this realm that whatever happens stays here, but it doesn't. It actually, everything that happens here is impacting every other world, every other planet, every other species. It's literally creating this ricochet effect that is like this massive, in, you know, infinite uh, butterfly effect. And that was super powerful. And do you have another uh, similar uh, experience that you had? I met um, what I call the crystal beings. And the crystal beings are, wow, they're really amazing. Um, they're hairless. They're extremely tall. Their skin is like a metallic -y shimmering skin. Their clothing is alive. Whatever the materials they have, it's like this, this living material. It's the weirdest thing I've ever seen that has consciousness in it. Um, incredible. Their world is incredible. They don't technically walk on the ground. Like, they'll glide above the ground. They, they're working with the alliances throughout the universe for the peace and to help this transition that's happening. So the crystal beings were to me incredibly interesting. Their clothing is incredibly interesting. It's just, I don't even know how to describe it. Their world is made of crystal. It's uh, very blue, like, um, we're, you know, like a dark, there's so much of dark blue in their in their world, but everything crystal. So that um, that was yeah an amazing. I've been there more than once while I was taken there. So, and that was, go ahead. That was more. Um, I have a you know I I want to say the word like ambassador of of. They feel to me like ambassadors of peace or, uh, you know, working with all of the alliances in the entire universe. So, um, and they, you know, they spoke a lot about respecting the laws because of free will and because, you know, they can only do so much in such a way that it doesn't impact everybody's individual path and will. So they spoke a lot about how limited they are in certain avenues because they need to respect these laws and these laws are universal. So what do you know about attaching spirits? Attaching spirits? Mm -hmm. Oh, you mean like when you go to a, a haunted area and you've got like demons hanging around or you've got like disincarnate souls that are uh, pretty nasty and mean and they attach to people? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I know quite a lot about it. Um, a lot of people have that, that problem. They don't realize. I mean, this is the thing that's happening. It's like an epidemic now because there's so many people that are doing ghost hunting. But they're really not equipped with the knowledge that they need to do this safely. So, they're, you know, there's tons of people doing this now. They're just bringing back whatever demons and whatever disincarnate you know, nasty kinetic ghosts that also can create these these creatures too. They're bringing them back home. Then they have the worst poltergeist activity or the worst um, supernatural experiences. They're tormented and they don't know how to how it happened. They don't know how to get rid of it. This well, is a huge problem. Have you had any direct experience with attaching spirits yourself? I've had, um, well, I mean, I've always seen ghosts. I've always seen uh, all that kind of stuff and demons. So um, luckily, um, yeah, I mean, there were times that they tried, but they couldn't. I've had a lot of, um, a lot of protection. I've been trained in deliverance. I've been trained in exorcism. I've been trained in all of these things. So 
you know, I, because of the nature of my life, I had to learn how to deal with all this because there was no way I was going to allow just whatever to happen. I mean, I grew up in houses that were extremely haunted, like horribly, horribly haunted with the weirdest phenomenon. Um, yeah, so I had to learn young how to deal with this all, right? So luckily, bar the hauntings that I grew up in, which a lot of the time came from what was already there when the homes were purchased, right? Um, I've had a lot of people I know who've had attachments um, that I've helped remove, but you know, I try to keep myself clean um, and keep the space completely divinely clean. So when you <laughs> removed your friends? I don't mess around with ghost hunting. Yeah. They so, like it, yeah. So when you removed your friends' attachments, yeah. how many times have you done that? Too many to count. I've done exorcisms, deliverances, like you name it. I've done a lot. So... What was the worst case I saw? Well, talk about, doesn't necessarily have to be the worst, but the most interesting. Could be the worst or could be not as bad, as long as it's the most interesting. Well, okay, so um, I had a, a Buddhist monk, well, Buddhist, he, he actually had a baby. He was a Buddhist, a fun, um, not a monk, but he dedicated his life to Buddhism. He had a little, little baby, he had a child, which was about um, two years old. He had an attachment that happened, but what happened was that attachment attached itself to the baby and possessed the baby. And I got called to go in to help him. And when I got there, the baby was on the ceiling making demonic sounds from what was in there. So that was like, I'd say was an exorcist moment um, for sure. And these are these are the things that like these things are real. This is what you know. I, Can you go I, through that experience? Did I go through it? Can you go through it now? Um, of of going in there and seeing the baby. Well, I mean, beyond uh, the baby's on the ceiling, he's uh, making demonic sounds and speaking. What what what, what, did, it, what did you do? Well, I exercised it. Not right away. I had to leave the room and I had to just pray and I had to, you know, had to feel everything out um, there. You know, I'm not going to go through everything I did because everybody can take a course and learn how to do this properly. It's, there's too much information, but you have to get yourself together to know exactly how to handle something like that. So and you have to get confirmation, too, because you need to know what you're dealing with what kind of demon you're dealing with. If it's more than one, you know, there's there's information you need to find out. Also, how it got in there. I know the baby was the weaker link, but it wasn't the baby that got this in there. It wasn't that. So I had to go and talk to the father and find out what's happened here. Where's the breach? What did you do? Because it wasn't the baby. It just attaches itself to the baby because the baby is the weaker link. So there's, you know, there's a lot of information that you need to know. And, and this is why ghost hunting does bug me because I know they just agitate. And a lot of the time they're dealing with demons. Demons can pretend to be people you love. They'll be at your door, have the exact same voice as the person who, you know, you know. And they'll be telling you to open the door and you'll hear your friend's voice or your wife's voice or your husband's voice. You'll see that they can transform into a cat. Um, like, it's like so much that we live in a supernatural reality. It is pure 100% supernatural. There's no fixed laws of physics. We are a complete creative mystery that it creates a supernatural experience. But our idea of normalcy, like me coming from not being normal, if you will, okay, so me being born the way I was born, 
I already knew that this is all supernatural. The illusion is when everything appears like it's fixed, appears like it's normal, and then they tell you about this so-called science that everything's fixed, physics are fixed, it's not. We are literally the epitome definition of supernatural. So if you had a client come to you and you, they asked you to remove uh, their demons, uh, you have a set fee you would charge them? Normally, well, I don't do that as much anymore because I did a lot of that for years and it's really tough. So I deal with stuff differently now. I think now more than ever, you've got portals opening like never before. You have, you know, demon infestations that are really bad. People have to understand what caused that to happen, what they did. They need to take responsibility. I always, you know, think that deliverance is good. They, you know, so I'm not going to tackle it the way I've tackled it in the past necessarily unless my father and mother say, hey, do that, do that person. And if it's so, I just do it. So you wouldn't take on a client today? You know what? Like I say, it, it isn't the same as it was. I've dealt with it for years. It's not an easy thing to deal with. You go into battle. Sometimes you almost die, depending, because you... You're in battle with these demons. You're not just going to do this for the rest of your life. It is a really tough thing to do. Unless the father and mother say, hey, do it on this person, then I do it. No questions asked. But people have to understand their responsibility, what caused it. If somebody goes ghost hunting and they bring this stuff back, I'm just not going to go over there and do it for them. I'm going to be like, you got to work out what you did to begin with and take responsibility, you should go and get a deliverance with a good deliverance church and ministry that has a good prayer team that can be the intercessors interceding for your protection and your divine, you put everything in order so that you can do the, the exorcism or the deliverance. Me doing it alone, you usually require somebody else to be an intercessor on your behalf. Because you're going one on one with these demons. So it isn't just easy, like, hey, just do it, right? You if you do it alone, it's a lot harder. So you gotta it's not something you can do forever. Okay, so um given that you have lived such a um interesting life and met so many different um, aliens and had so many near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences and done deliverances and exorcisms and so forth. All the things that you've gone through, uh, we're approaching an hour and you, we've got maybe half an hour, more or less, we can uh, use up and uh, what would what do you think would be the most valuable use of your time that you'd like to talk about for the next half hour? What what area do you think is uh, would interest the listeners and be valuable to speak about? Honestly, I think that I think people want to know more about what's going on with the ghosts and with these uh, demonic attachments. I think that I think people yearn to know more about stuff like that. Have you had any experience with that? Uh, I have two demonic attachment experiences. Yeah, and what happened? I ha I've had them all my life. Yeah. And you never got them removed? Correct. Did you ever go and try? Um, not to, not in the way you're, that you're thinking. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that I've ever been in a church that I trusted yeah. had the power to remove them. Mm. Uh, you know, people, um, I was in Peru. I went to Peru once to uh, drink the ayahuasca, and it was uh, just the opposite of what you should do. <laughs> uh, 
uh, it was just the exactly the wrong thing to do. And but one thing I did notice when I was there, other than I had uh, uh, there was one close encounter I had with an alien craft and are sort of close and uh, not really that close, but and uh, it was it was an interesting experience, but there was. Uh, reported to be an actual, you know, mo most shamans are like most priests. They don't have a clue when it comes to exorcism. But there was reported to be an actual exorcist in Iquitos when I was there. Uh, I didn't know where he was or how to get to him. But if I had made an effort, I might have been able to uh, find the guy. But you know, I would say that the vast majority of shamans don't have a clue when it comes to removing attaching spirits, and uh, it, just like the same with priests. Yeah, so. I, I agree with you. That's the problem, right? I mean, I've had a, I've had experiences when I've removed in battle, um, and the body of the person started levitating. There was a huge, huge explosion that sounded throughout the entire sky when it happened. And everyone in the community heard it like everybody thought it was the end of the world. Because at the point when I managed, when it, you know, it was completed, that's when this all happened. You heard this massive explosion. The guy's body levitated. And then there was literally, supernaturally a line a huge line of these massive insects that are not even insects we have here in british columbia like we're talking the weirdest beetles that are found in different locations of the world and just different insects and all walking in a completely straight line right through my place and then getting close to the door disappearing witnessed by the guy and uh, so you can see a lot of immense uh, reactions when it's completed that tells you the nature of what you were battling, how strong it was, you know. And to me, that was very successful because of all of the, but I usually always would have something critical, like when I work, it's, you know, it tends to be. Well, when I worked at the FBI, I had some interesting customers, including the CIA, the, the FBI, and a lot of other interesting customers. But when I worked in the, in the J. Edgar Hoover building uh, for the FBI, there was a guy who sat right next to me and, you know, elbow length away from me. Uh, he had worked for the CIA for many years and he'd worked for the FBI for many years. And uh, was another. Um, I'm getting off track. Was another guy, different, not him. It was a different guy who sat across from me. And it was a long, thin room. And this other fellow, he um, he told me that he had his own attaching spirits, and he had met this Indian, and the Indian took him into a house, and he removed his attaching spirit or spirits. And uh, and he said later on he went to look for this house, and the house wasn't there anymore. Uh, yep. So the house that he went into was not a physical house. Nope. It was when he went in. Yeah, but, it might have been when he went in. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't a permanent physical house. Nope. And that to me is celestial intervention, right? That that happens to remove that, and you know. When you really truly desire it, it's amazing what can happen. And that I love that story. I think that's a brilliant story. Well, I I once asked a guy when I I was IMing a fellow, instant messaging a fellow, and I asked him, Do you think I could get my attaching spirits removed? And he said, No. And I said, Why not? And he said, Well, because you want to have a show. And and I said, Oh yeah, you're right. And I'd forgotten. Uh, see, I have this dream, um, and uh, in the dream, it's, it's sort of a fantasy. Uh, I'm sitting in a chair, 
facing a crowd and they're all sitting in their chairs and there's a snake of people uh, on the side of the on the walkway next to the chairs and the snake ends in front of me and there's a guy standing there with a watch and and uh, and each person who gets into the front of the line uh, the snaking line that uh, person has basically one minute to stand behind me and stick their arm out to the side of my head and I will grab their hand and stick it on my head you see I've I've d done this with my wife. I stuck her hand on top of my head and she could feel the vibrations of the attaching spirit. And she said it was the weirdest thing she'd ever felt in her life. I'm sure that's, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what she said. And so I figured if she could feel the vibrations of the demon that sits in my head, then other people could also. So if we live stream this on YouTube and, uh, and all these people put their hand, if I put their hand on my head where it's sitting in that given moment and they feel its vibrations and it's live streamed on YouTube and recorded and you see their reaction, uh, vision, their facial reaction to what they feel there on my head and every person in that room who wants to put their hand up there gets to do it and you get to see all their reactions and if we did that uh, type of event over and over and over, eventually I think uh, humanity would come to some conclusion that attaching spirits are not people's fantasy and that they're real and that humanity might choose to make a, a uh, wake up and see the smell of roses and get an idea that this is the cause of all of the darkness on this planet and make a change mm. so the question comes down is uh do i go for the dream or do i go for the removal which is the proper path wouldn't you think the removal well you're still a witness to it happening but you don't need to be complicit in an agenda that uses and utilizes your life force and body and you know is endangering you well it's tried to kill me at least once that's why my hip was broken and uh, i was riding a bicycle and i was seeing a reality that didn't exist and uh made a mistake and that's how i broke my hip and uh, but i figured that if i could change the world somehow uh, that would be worth uh, not removing it until I could do that. So. Well, do you know the point of attachment? Do you remember? Um, well, I know that um, uh, not exact. Yes and no. Okay, so there was a time where I was sitting, laying on my bed. I was unemployed and I was, uh, it was very sunshiny outside, but all the curtains, all the uh, shades were closed, but there was still a lot of light in the room in those days where I'd be unemployed and I'd be laying on my bed just trying to relax. And I would have something sitting on my feet and I could feel the wind going around this thing in a circle. Mm -hmm. um, and it it kept doing that a, day after day after day, and it, it very slowly it would move up my legs to where it was like sitting on my lower legs and then on my knees and so forth. That might have been it. Now the reason um, when I was in Oregon, I met a lady that uh, talked to a psychic friend of hers, and the psychic told her that the way I got my problem, uh, being the two attachments, was by smoking pot. I stayed high morning, noon, and night for 18 years. So somewhere in, hold on a second, let me open my window a little bit, get a little more light. Um, it's finally dimmed down a little bit where it's a little too, too dark. So, um, 
Yeah, so I stayed high morning, noon, night for 18 years of my life from the age of 16 to the age of 34. And I was laying on my bed one day and I had a spirit come upon me and it um, it was a positive spirit and it it was covering my whole body and it said, my first commandment to you is to stop smoking. And it was using the the um, the speech patterns in my brain. I didn't hear a special voice. Right. So it was just like I was talking to myself. So it said, my first commandment to you is to stop smoking. So from that moment to the present, I never have touched pot. It was uh, it was my um, my way of kicking the addiction or how it happened. So, uh, but. Um, so somewhere between the age of 16 and the age of 34, because of all the getting high, was when uh, they attached. Now, the actual moment, I mean, I, I've gone through a lot of New Age ceremonies. There was one where um, we were, everybody was standing in a line in a huge circle, and you, you would take your hand and put it on the back of the head of the person in front of you. Now, that might have been uh, one of the uh, experiences. There was another New Age event I went through where these women were um, were pairing up with the people that were doing the experiment. And I was invited to be the first one, so I was unconscious. And when I woke up, there was a lady kneeling over another person and she was making a motion like she was breaking something. Like she was breaking, intuitively I got the notion that she was breaking the the uh, the protection that the person had. Yeah. And so that could have, might have been it. So there, there could have been any number of moments in my life where it could have occurred, but you know, the actual attaching events I couldn't you know couldn't did you have poltergeist activity growing up did did you have it like your upbringing did you experience some um, a lot of uh strange things poltergeisty stuff ghost stuff well uh I would say yes <laughs> I I saw um Christmas photos where you could see ectoplasm in the photos. Yes. I saw when I was uh, when I was telling you what uh, when I was laying on my bed in my apartment. At that time, I was about eighteen ish, or maybe a little bit older. And I would go into I would get up from my bed, and I would go into the bathroom, and I would start urinating urinating at the at the uh, toilet and I would look up in the mirror and there was there was this full wall length mirror and I would see this uh, being uh, in the mirror and I would turn uh, while I'm still pee pissing I would turn my head around I could see it uh, hovering in the doorway and it was a uh, it didn't have a particular shape. It was like energy that was mostly see-through, but barely visible, but very obvious at the same time. And uh, it would, I would see that thing like every, almost every day, you know, for a period. So yeah, that's another one. That's and, when it started. If your, the, your situation began when you were little. Probably. And it just took some time, right? For it to find a way in. Sure. Mm -hmm. What other things did you experience? Oh, uh, you mean when I was young? Mm. Just different things. I mean, like the um, we we're talking. You're talking aliens a while ago, right? So, I was in my kitchen one day with my mother when I was young, and we heard an owl on the roof. It was very loud. It was like the like it was like the owl was in the room with us, and uh, I said, "Oh, that's an owl. I'm, I'm gonna go out, run outside and see what it looks like." And my mom was like afraid of me, 
going out to look at the owl. Owls are not threatening. I, I, to this day, I never have figured out why she was afraid of the owl. But uh, the only experience of an alien nature when I was a kid that I ever remember having was I was sitting in my living room and with my sister and my parents. And by the way, my mother does not remember this. My sister does not remember it. My father's deceased, so I can't ask him. Okay, so we're sitting there and there's this huge window on the front uh, side of the house. And this guy pulls up into an old blue beat up uh, car, you know, one of those cars you wonder if it's still running or not. And uh, he jumps out of the driver's seat, turns around, walks towards the back of the car, makes it he just makes a long U-turn around the car. And he's coming up the passenger side and then turns and starts going towards our house. And he gets about halfway to the house and I'm looking at him and I realize he's a full blooded Indian. And uh, I don't even know if at that age I even knew what a full-blooded Indian looked like. But looking back, I, somehow I knew that this guy was a full-blooded Indian. He was like super dark skin. And uh, anyway, he walked up to the door. He opened the, the screen door, knocked on the door. My dad did not hesitate. He walked over, opened the front door, and the guy... You know, if a stranger comes to your house, generally they stay outside until they've uh, until you talk to them and allow and allow them to come in. He didn't do that. He stepped right into the house without hesitation. He's between the the uh, door and the opening to the door, and I can I don't remember who was standing in front of him, but he was taller than. It must have been my mother standing standing in front of him because my father is. Well, taller, so I would think it would be her, but he was slightly taller than the person in front of him, either my mom or my dad, and I could see like the top top half of his head and uh, just part of it. And the in, the strange part of the whole story is, right that moment the story ends. What? Yeah, that's the end of the story. I don't remember one moment past the. Whoa. I don't remember him coming inside, speaking, nothing. <laughs> so, so, you know, I don't know if that was an alien. I don't know what that was. I just know that he didn't hesitate coming inside. And he, and then the story ends without an ending. And so, so what do you think that was? That was, an, was that an alien? <laughs> I think that was, yeah, I think that was a shapeshifter alien in disguise. And I think a part of it is like using an overlay in your mind so that you normalize a part of it so you don't actually remember what you were looking at. And then I think, you know, lights out because you're abducted and you're unconscious. Well, the thing about, I always call myself uh, a contactee and not an abductee because I have no implants, I have no missing time, I've never been taken on a craft, I've... Um, sure about that? Well, <laughs> that I remember. Right. Right. So, uh, they either have to be perfect abductors who've never screwed up even one time in my whole life, and uh, I mean, that is theoretically possible, mm. but you know, I, I, uh, I have some claustrophobia. I once took a job developing film and I quit by lunch that day. So in pitch darkness, I really can't handle the claustrophobia. But short of that, I really don't have any of the experiences that most abductees have. And so, a lot of abductees don't remember anything at all. I mean, actually, they get memory through hypnosis. Then right. they start remembering. Well, my problem with hypnosis, I've been hypnotized uh, probably hundreds of times, but I've never been regressed. So nobody has ever, you know, I would barter with other hypnotists. I, I'm a hypnotist myself. I've helped people remove. I did one uh, successful exorcism through hypnosis. and. 
Uh, I've tried five or six other times, it didn't work. But um, I've had one abductee that was a, used as a breeder for the greys and had 55 offspring and 72 uh, encounters with the greys. She was one of my clients. So I'm, I'm a good hypnotist and I borrowed with these people to, um, you know, they would do me, I would do them for an hour. Yeah. Each time I'd go over, and I've never had anybody successfully regress me ever, not even once in my whole life. Wow. So I don't know that I can be regressed. I can go in, I can listen to myself snore. Do you know how, do you know how to do that? No. Okay, so what you do is, uh, a lot of hypnotists will do you, uh, will put you in a state of trance uh, one step at a time. So they first get you to relax your body. Then they, and while you're relaxing your body, you relax your mind. And then once your body's relaxed, you continue relaxing your mind, and then they regress you or whatever they're gonna do with you. But uh, once your body is, uh, snoring is not a symptom of sleep, it's a symptom of physical relaxation. So it's not commonly known, but once your body uh, gets to a particular state of relaxation, you'll start snoring regardless of whether you're wide awake or not. So I do that all the time. I put my body to sleep. My mind will not follow. And I listen, you know, I did it today, uh, listening to myself snore. It, it doesn't last very long, but, uh, you know, and you tend to go out or whatever. But, it, you know, once your body's asleep, you will start snoring regardless of your state of mind. So in have any you, case. Have you ever heard of transference, hypnotic transference? uh well maybe describe it well it's it's kind of an interesting story actually you might enjoy it um i try to get hypnotized because my abductions were so um i mean i was abducted each time i was abducted two times in particular one i was missing for a week the other one i was missing for four days. Uh, that's a long time to be gone and to be abducted. So I wanted to have memory of what had happened. I found a hypnotist who was very good, had a lot, many years of experience, apparently could hypnotize even those that were not hypnotizable. And when I went in, she started hypnotizing me. And the next thing I know, there was a transference that happened. So she was the one that went into hypnosis, but she was looking into all of my stuff and able to see, but she went crazy. I had to call the ambulance. And she had to be taken to hospital. She was in a mental institution for a week. And when I went to see her, because I wanted to make sure she was all right. I mean, this was freaky. It like scared the heck out of me. Um, I went to see her after she got out of the hospital and she was so scared. She was like, I, this has never happened before. I don't know how this happened, but it was, she called it hypnotic transference. And um, she could, she connected with me and was able to see some of the things which you know horrified her because of the nature of the the stuff that i was experiencing um terrified her did did she go into detail about uh what it was she i mean when you went to see her she was still in the hospital right no it was after she got out okay so did she describe in detail what exactly she saw that, that drove her over the edge? Uh, all I got from her, because she just was so terrified and didn't want to really talk to me, um, this experience, like, I mean, was probably one of the worst things in her life, that she basically saw a box, this huge box, she saw two huge celestial guardians guarding the box. It opened. When she peered in, 
she said she started seeing some of the things that that I witnessed and had happened and like the supernatural element of my life, right? And that's as far as I got. That's as far as she would tell me. She said, I've just, and some of it was like, you know, I know she said, I don't understand the government um, and the experiments because she was able to see some of that. And of course I know about that, but she didn't understand what she was looking at. She didn't understand you know, you're, you're, from what I gathered, she witnessed enough and couldn't handle it and lost her mind. And then that was all I got. And I was, I've always been curious, like, has this happened to other people? What happened to cause this hypnotic transference? Like it weirded me out. I was I felt horrible for her. I mean, I think it's like a bizarre experience to have happen when you're going in for hypnosis. Well, I've heard of um, people reading the minds of their... Okay, I've had um, more than one client read my mind. Hmm. Okay, but they weren't like there was a client I had that I didn't think was very she she wasn't very pretty and I had the idea that she wasn't very pretty and she picked that up and she started she came out of trance and she was very angry at me because I you know didn't think highly of her physicality uh, and I had another time where I was trying to get uh, a client to cooperate and they, uh, the subconscious mind was over, being overprotective, and uh, and at some point, you know, I'm trying to regress them, and at some point I gave up, and I was gonna, I was reaching for a book of affirmations, positive affirmations that I was gonna read to her instead of regressing her or him, and uh, and the person uh, was like like this, they came up, they opened their eyes, they said, try again, and went back down. And so basically they read my mind that I was giving up and they came out and said, keep going, try again. And, and, and then they cooperated after that. And there was another similar time where, um, where I was trying to get them to cooperate, they wouldn't cooperate and I, Suddenly, I realized that I should talk to the higher self, and so I asked the higher self. My teacher never taught me about the higher self, and this was long before QHHT was ever invented, and uh, I wasn't taught about the higher self. I just came up with uh, a notion that there was a higher self on my own, off the fl you know, cut, you know, on the fly, and the higher self talked to the subconscious mind and got it to cooperate. So that's when I started working with the higher self. But uh, I've never heard of anybody, an experience exactly like yours, no. Yeah, and you know, I thought to myself, well, I mean, if it was going to go super weird and x filey, yeah, of course it would happen when I'm trying to get regressed, right? Some, Because it was very supernatural. It was, it was just totally traumatic. Poor girl. I felt, felt so horrible for her. So, have you ever been uh, regressed over Skype? No, never. Do you want to be? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, uh, if I can help you in any way over Skype as a regressionist, I'll be happy to um, help you the same way that lady tried to help you. I don't. I don't think you're. I don't think I'm going to get uh, transferred no. like she did, and uh, I'm not afraid of that. If even if I was, I'm not sure I would react the same way. I, I uh, do you know anything about mind control? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Have you ever had people try to mind control you? Okay, so. Uh, I've gone through the same experience. I, I was in a um, 
jail uh, cell because of some uh, uh, some conflict with me and my wife, and I was in till like two or three in the morning, and I was kind of pretty much asleep. And the, these two cops came in the uh, jail cell, and they were dressed like they were on the street. Now think about that. The cops are always required to turn in their guns before they're allowed in the jail building. Mm-hmm. They don't even get in the building, let alone in the cell with their guns, right? Yeah. And never allowed. No. Okay. Well, these guys came in, not only in the building, but in the cell with me with their sidearms. They were fully dressed like on the street, right? And they took me out of the room, out of the out of the building, put me in their car and drove me a long ways away, like an hour away, and uh, drove into another building and dropped me there. And when I got into that building, it was, um, that building looked like they had just been manufactured 10 minutes before I walked in the room. There was no, there was no dust, there were no scratches, there were no people, and it looked uh, shiny on the floor every there was no scratch anywhere it was like perfect right and it was open like it was like in the you ever seen the show 60 days in you ever seen that show there's a tv show called 60 days in where they they're in a jail and they're pretending to be prisoners and they're gathering information for the sheriff yeah okay so it's kind of it looks the cell The jail uh, facility looked like that, except it was much, the opening that was the main part was much bigger, much, much larger than that. And there was no, uh, there were no metal tables on the bottom floor where people could eat. Instead, there were these pot, really weird shaped pods that were like three pieces of metal uh, uh, riveted together. And they were like uh, just a, a dome of metal with a door and really something I've never seen before or since. And I was putting one of those and uh, it's a long story. I won't go into it too much further, but uh, I basically spent, let's see, four, uh, six day. Uh, let's see, the first half night was in the regular jail. And then the re- next four days were in that facility getting mine, mine screwed. And, uh, and then after the, after, on the fifth day, they are like the four and a half day into that, they drove me to a, a, an insane asylum, dropped me off there for three, for 72 hours of observation. After being mine screwed for, four and a half days ish and i couldn't speak about what happened in the jail because i'd never gotten out of the institution had opened my mouth about what happened in the jail okay if i'd said one word about any of that to anybody in the facility you wouldn't be talking to me now so i had to keep my mind mouth shut about what happened in that jail when i was in the institution they kept me for 72 hours without without being drugged just for observation and then after 72 hours, I was let out of there, and I got to go home. So, oh. uh, anyway, that's my experience, and that's the very, very short version of it. Wow. Uh, in that jail cell, it's some really weird, the weirdest thing that ever happened to me in that jail cell was there was a, they were moving me around from place to place. When I'd go unconscious, they would put stuff in the food that would keep me fully unconscious and instead of just being normally asleep and then they would grab me and take me and put me in a different place like in a different pod or in a regular room that was like a regular jail cell and i was in a regular room like a regular jail cell except for the the door had a a, a horizontal slot in it that was like a little bit taller than you would normally see and then a vertical slit in it also that was just like part of the door that wasn't there it was totally open 
and uh, like you would slide in trays and stuff, but it didn't have a lock or close off or anything. It was totally open. And so I was sitting in that particular cell. I don't know how I got into it. Don't know how I got out of it, but um, but I was looking at these guards that were outside, and then all of a sudden, outside the cell, part of the world uh, was like uh, animation, like cartoons, like on Saturday, you know, the cartoons. Yeah, yeah. Mixed in with the regular world. Whoa. And so, uh, you know, I if somebody put a gun in my head and said, "Make something like this up." I, there's no way I could make it up. I know, my mind I know. could not create such a weird phenomenon. And the way it was playing out, it was like the the virtual world was fighting the regular world, and one was invading the other. They had all these different themes that were playing out. Um, one other thing I'll tell you about the event was um, I was in this pod. I was in the pod the whole whole uh, four ish. Four and a half days I was there. I was in the pod most of the time. Uh, I was never allowed outside the pod except for this one event, which I'll tell you about. Okay. They let me out of the pod. I'm standing just outside the pod. There's a guard standing about five or six feet from me looking at me. And there's a, I can see a black prisoner. This is another thing about this place. They had no Mexican. They did bring some other pretend prisoners in there, but they were just pretending, right? Yeah. There were, there were no Mexicans, no whites, no light skinned blacks. All there was was dark skinned blacks, like we were in Africa. And that's it. There was only like six or six or more of those in the whole facility. You could have put three hundred people in this facility and there probably wasn't more than six people total in the whole facility. Okay. Now there was a I'm looking at this guard, right? And behind him on the other side of this this opening. I can see a a, black, a a dark black skinned prisoner inside a cell looking at me through this vertical slit on on this door, and he's just look, looking at me like this. And all of a sudden, he pushes the door open. And he steps out, and he walks a few foot forward, and he looks at the guard, and he says, "Same time tomorrow." And the guard goes, looks at him, and goes, "Yes, same time tomorrow." And he walks out of the facility and leaves. Whoa! Pretend he was a pretend prisoner. Okay, so um, those are some of the stranger experiences that were ha happened in that facility. Uh, and there were a lot of other strange things too that, that we need to talk about that. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't know what you want to talk about. It's just the bizarre, very bizarre. Uh, six, seven day. Not it was nine days total. Uh, f like five, five and a half days in the jail and three and a half days in the in sol asylum. That's about what uh, the whole thing was. But anyway, uh, if you want to uh, get regressed and get your missing time, I will be happy to borrow that for a nice little exorcism. <laughs> I, th I think uh, it would be interesting to find out what... Uh... Well, you know what? The exorcisms need to be done in person. Yeah, I don't know that I can afford to fly it, up to Canada. It's not um it's not safe to do it unless you're in person. Yeah. Well, think, but I'll tell you what, my regression for I I I work with people and their attachments in a different way, which it it is helpful. So you know, especially if you're doing it online, you have to do things differently. So I, yeah, I'd be happy for us to to do something like that, and maybe you can crack the uh, the missing time. Well, I did have a client who was, um, as I mentioned before, she was used as a breeder for. Uh, she, as far as the grays go, she probably one race of grays. I shouldn't I shouldn't speak about the grays like they're a single race, but the grays that she encountered, uh, she could be one of the most knowledgeable people in the world uh, regarding them because the whole time she was on the craft, uh, she, one of the reasons uh, I asked her, why did they pick you? And she said, well, I'm very psychic. And uh, she said, you know, when her parents were 
before she was born, she was hovering over the over the bodies of her mother and father, and while her while her body was in the womb, and she could get in and out of her body while she was in the womb, and she was able to do this uh, after she was born and all the way through her life, and then when she was abducted and, and used as a breeder, uh, when they had her on the craft, they had her uh, strapped down to a table. She would get out of her body and go around the craft and she would jump inside the minds of all these grays that are, you know, they're they're doing the hive mind thing. And she's getting in, she'd get in one of them and she'd get him to look down or do this, do different things. And he would realize, they would realize that somebody was in their head. And because they're the hive mind, the other one, the more powerful one would would pick it up even before the one she was in their head of, and they would push her out and force her back into the her uh, body, and you know she kept getting out, and she learned uh, quite a bit about them, and that's all in my book, which I hope to get published one day. Oh, I can't wait. Yeah, that's a small part of the book. It's like one chapter, uh, but I don't know if that'll ever be published because I have. I don't have a strong desire to self-publish it, and and I may end up doing that eventually. But uh, you know, I I'd rather find a, a regular publisher. But uh, in any case, say again. The stories need to get out. I remember when I was little, I used to be picked up by craft, and that was actually my school. So when I actually had to go to school. As a, as a young kid, it was so confusing to me because I was like, I'm already in school. <laughs> and I couldn't understand why they were making me go to school twice, two different schools, because I'm on a craft and I'm getting schooled. Like I'm in school, picked up every day, taken to the craft and taught a bunch of stuff. And then, and then I had to go to a physical school. So it was so confusing. Okay, so um, hold on a second here. I had to get up to grab something just for you. Let's see if I can uh, show it here. Uh, what are, uh, one second. Let me see if I can. I have to un. Uh, I have to uh, change my background and I have to unblur. All right, here we go. We're unblurred now. And here we go. Have you seen uh, the human? The new human. Oh. That's uh, Mary Rodwell's latest book. OK, I haven't seen it, no. OK, so that book. Um, hold on, let me put my blur back on. Is that the one that you're talking about? Like your client that? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, this is. Um, the only reason I brought this up is because um, you were just talking about being school. Mm. And the book is about uh, autistic children. And she explains in her book that uh, most, if not all, autistic children, the reason why they're so um, inside their heads and not out here communicating with everybody is mm -hmm. because they're so advanced they're seeing multi multi dimensions just like somebody who's crazy right being fed uh, another reality through their attaching spirit uh, like I was when I broke my hip but um, they are more advanced than us genetically they're more advanced because they can see you know, the, the, the reason why I brought it up is because you mentioned about being schooled mm. on the craft and a lot of these children are being schooled by aliens as well. And a lot of them remember their schooling before they were born. And a lot of the knowledge they're being taught in school, they know 100 times more than their <laughs> teachers do. But, the you know, the teachers don't know, understand that. And so... Uh, they thought I was. Um, they actually thought I was mentally challenged, and they failed me. 
this was what was crazy. I was bored as all get out. I couldn't believe it. I thought I was in, you know, land of the dum-dums. And here they are thinking that, you know, she's mentally challenged. So we're going to fail her. And then, I mean, I'm little, right? And I'm already, I'm on a ship every day. I'm, I'm getting schooled. It's 3D. You know, we have 3D devices, like 3D all around, not just here. Like you're surrounded by like, whatever you're being educated by um, only to discover that um, finally they knew that I was way beyond because I was reading Fahrenheit 451 was my first book that I read when all the kids were reading Jack and Jill went up the hill. <laughs> I had already read Fahrenheit 451 and the teacher thought I just liked the book and I was pretending. And when she was talking to me, I started I was like, no, I read the book. It's impossible. You know, they're thinking I'm mentally challenged. And I was like, they thought I was a bit autistic as well, right? And because uh, I had overstimulation, I was always out of my body. I had like, there was just certain things that were very autistic. And then when I started reciting all of the information that I just read in the book, then they realized, oh my God, we just failed her. And she's like way advanced. So yeah, she's she's hit the nail on the head. These kids are way advanced. Same with all the waves of the people, the people coming in here to do this work already have a lot of knowledge. You put them in this kind of non-education system and it, it feels like a dead end. Feels well, like washing and, you know, mind manipulation and really mind control, right? Like, that's that's what it feels like. Just it's not really educational at all. Well, when when I was young and the, all the kids, the other kids were do, using crayons, I was drawing perspective drawings like an architect draws, where you have, you know, buildings that recede off and in, in both sides into the distance. I was doing that while everybody else was with crayons. Right. So I was a little advanced when I was a kid too. So. You know, it would be fascinating. I, I mean, your experiences are great. I would love to, for us to do a part two. And I'd love to go deeper into your stuff because there's so much you experience. There's so many things that you can connect it to. Well, um, you've probably got a million things to talk about that are we haven't touched in this. Um, so I would rather focus on you than me. But also, you know, if you have, if you want the missing time, uh, you know, I've hung out with some fairly famous uh, ufologists in the day, my day. Mm -hmm. I've, uh, the guy who investigated my, uh, for my early close encounters was John Schusler. He's still alive, but he was the, one of the founders of MUFON. And he was the international head of MUFON. And I knew him uh, a long time ago. And um, the one of the other founders of MUFON was somebody that I hung out with. Um, I'm trying to think of his name. I can't remember the guy's name off the top of my head. But he was one of the early founders of MUFON also. And then there's also uh, Peter Davenport. You know who that is? Mm, yeah. Okay, so I... I used to go to his meetings, the New Fork meetings as well, and I've hung out some interesting ufologists. But uh, in any case, uh, I should, I've tried to get them to let me, uh, even uh, not the current head of MUFON, but the last one that was caught uh, going after young girls. Remember that? Mm hmm. OK, so he told me that uh, I could do regressions with abductees and then he handed me off to um, what's her face? The, uh, the lady who is always uh, doing speeches with traveling with Stan Friedman when he was alive. Uh, I'm trying to think of her name. Uh, Kathleen Martin. He handed me off to Kathleen Martin, who was the head of research for MUFON at the time. And she said, well, uh, 
they gave there were certain requirements like you had to have a, a current practice hypnotherapy practice which i didn't have i had a practice before then and uh, but didn't have a current one when i was trying to uh, do regressions for mufon so from that perspective i wasn't qualified and so uh, they wanted me to have uh, certain medical type certifications that are beyond the scope of a hypnotist to have and they're generally not required but they MUFON requires those things because of liability reasons okay. and so I can understand why they would want to do that uh, but uh, she handed Kathleen Martin had me off, handed me off to another fellow who uh, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he said no. <laughs> you can't. You can't do regressions for us. Now the the head of Georgia Mufon has told me a number of times that he would let me do regressions, but he's never brought anybody to me because he has a a guy that he uses regularly uh, who's done hundreds of them. And it was really strange that Kathleen Martin said that this one hypnotist that I'm talking about just now was not qualified and I was like uh, you're talking about your official guy your official move on guy chosen by your state director you're saying he's not qualified really and I was like huh it kind of caught me off guard when she said that but uh, in any case uh, move on never allowed me to do regressions of any hypnotist of any uh, abductees nor did Peter Davenport or anybody else I've ever been associated with. I've only had a chance to work with the one lady who came to me. She was one of uh, Daryl Sims' uh, clients as a, hypnot uh, as a hypnotist. He, he uh, is a, uh, he's a, a um, what do you call it uh, when you do, uh, okay. it was a, he was a surgery related hypnotist and where you put people in a trance instead of giving them anesthesia. So uh, he had helped her come up with like 20, 24 of her uh, encounters with the Greys. And, and then when she came to me, she realized it wasn't 24, 72. And I was able to help her a lot more than he was, even though he, you know, claims to be one of the best. Uh, I, was, I did a much better job than he did, according to her. She paid me once. She paid me for two sessions of regular hypnosis we got through uh, she actually um uh released like 3800 plus events uh, abusive events with her mother in one session and uh and i was told that that was not possible that you know after you can only release so much at a given time otherwise it imbalances you and you go nuts but uh, I found out that what I was told wasn't accurate because she did release all that stuff in the one session. And then the second session, I went to check, and sure enough, she did release it all in the first session because I wasn't sure if it really worked or not. And then come to find out there were 72 events left over that we still needed to work on. And she was told what those were, and after the end of the second session, she came out of trance and said, what were the 72 other events? And she said that's what uh, her her experiences with the grays, 72, let's see, 24 implantations, 24 checkups, 24 removals, 72 total, 48 abductions. The, the, the checkups, they didn't, uh, they didn't take her anywhere. They just came in and checked her out, her fetus out uh, at, at the uh, halfway mark. And they, they keep, them, uh, keep people with fetuses for 10, 10 weeks. Uh, two month, uh, little over, little over two months, two and a half months, and then they remove the fetus at, at the ten week mark. So, anyway, um, that's uh, was my one abductee client that I've had a chance to work with. So, I've uh, even though I've known a lot of ufologists who had abductee uh, people that came to them. They always took them to people like Yvonne Smith or some of the other more famous hypnotists or people that they were already using, and they would never trust me. So I've only had a chance to work with one so far, 
and uh, I thought I did a pretty good job. So sounds like it, yeah. Uh, anyway, she paid me the when we did the four sessions on on aliens. I wasn't charging her for that. That was all free, and one of those sessions she actually paid my full amount for, even though I didn't ask for the money. So I knew that she did that. She told me she paid me because she got such ben a benefit out of it that she felt it was important for her to pay me. So uh, she was great. great even though I didn't didn't ask for the money. So that kind of gives you an idea that that I did more than just pull up information. I, I try to tell people that even if I'm doing a uh, uh, an alien, uh, you know, trying to get information, I'm not just doing it for that. I, I'm you're going to come out feeling significantly better than when you went in. Uh, because I do a lot of therapy surrounding the, you know, the releasing of, to, you know, get past the blockages and things like that. Uh, in addition to all that, I always throw in a bunch of things that where when you come out, you're going to feel way better than when you went in. You'll feel lighter and different, and you'll notice a big difference in your body, not just in your mind after you're if you're done, that's I. It's the one thing I promise people. I can't promise anything other than that 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 you'll come out better than when you went in. So. Okay, awesome. Have you ever tried hypnotizing yourself? Oh, many times. I've, uh, like I said, I was listening to myself snore today. Okay. So I can I can relax my body a lot, but I, and I can relax my mind. But doing a self regression. It's kind of pretty much impossible because when you get down deep enough to to regress, you're no longer your logic half part of your brain is really not. It's pretty can relaxed. Or can you record you doing a complete hypnotic regression all the way to the very end to bring yourself back, and you just press play, and you just allow yourself to go in and follow the whole. That's a thought. I, I've, I used to uh, do, in fact, I've got a, a link on my website where I tell people how to do exactly that, except for the, except for the regression, just the induction part. Yeah. Uh, which I tell people how to do induction tapes, how to create them. So I can do the induction, induction part. I've never attempted the actual regression half of that. So that is a that is a thought, you know, to do. But uh, but I think it'd be pretty cool. I do. Okay, so I I really do want to talk more about your experiences because because I think they're really important. I just want to say that I'm, you know, we can incorporate a little bit of me, a little bit of you, and go deep in there because those experiences that you talked about were fascinatingly revealing about many other things that are happening in your world that are managed. Well, um, there was uh, some events I've experienced that I still to this day don't quite understand. Um, mm -hmm. I'll give you one of those just just to just to um, have something to say. I will. I saw a fellow. I say a fellow. I don't know what he was. I saw a humanoid, which I thought was a human, standing maybe a football length away from me, or a little bit less, maybe two, three hundred yards. And then three or four, six, five, six, ten seconds later, he's standing in front of me. And then within a second or two, he's gone. So what that was, whether that was a demon or a human or an alien, I have no idea what that was. But um, that's an example. Um, whoever mind screwed me in that jail, I, to this day, uh, I have no idea who that was. I don't, I don't know if that was... I, I keep that, you know, I first thought, you know, that was CIA. First thing that came to my mind, that's one of my customers. I've worked for them. And but 
Uh, but, you know, thinking about it enough, I was like, eh, I don't think they have that level of technology. It's, there were things that I saw and experienced that were sort of beyond mind control, like you would think of it as normally being. Like, like for instance, if a, a gray went, got his face right in front of you, looked into your eye, and went into your uh, eye with his astral body and went through your uh, your your uh, optical cord into your brain and then created another reality that was totally real to you. It's that level of technology that you know the grays can do, but I don't know. I don't know that humans have quite that level of technology at this point in time. So maybe they do, but I, I sort of doubt it. But um, you know, I don't doubt that there were that in that facility those were actual regular humans. But um, you know, there's lots of things about this world that we still don't know what that is. So. Well, often they'll set up. Well, maybe we'll end with this because I do have to go. But um, sometimes they set up. Like what I what I realized was happening to me is that they would set up a a location close to where I was living, and then they would watch me. But I caught on to this, and I actually found these places two times in two different places that I was living in. And when I discovered them, they packed everything up like they were never there and they were gone. Next morning, it looked like they had never even been there. So I think they manage and they do all these things and they have all the resources to do it. Sometimes we're just lucky enough to catch it. And your experience, thank goodness, you didn't get drugged and you didn't stay in that institution. They wanted to probably make sure you weren't going to talk about it, which was smart. You didn't. Because you got to go. Well, um, the, when I was in the uh, institution for those 72 hours, I had three different encounters with uh, psychiatrists. One was a guy sitting across from me, the first one. And uh, and we had a long conversation about attaching spirits, and my attaching spirits. And he asked me, why are you in here? And I said, uh, I'm in here for the same reason as every other person is in here, because I have problems with attaching spirits. That's what causes insanity. And I, I don't think he understood that when I told it to him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I was, uh, as you see, I'm sitting here talking to you. Obviously, you believed me at some point. And then uh, that attaching spirits do cause insanity. Oh, for and sure. There was a uh, there was a point when I was in that institution. It, on the last day, I was in the room with a bunch of insane children. And there was like eight or ten of them. And they were all completely insane. And uh, the interesting part of the experience was that one of the interesting parts was too, I couldn't see their eyes. Ah, whoa. Couldn't see their eyes. You know, I could look straight in their eyes. I couldn't see the actual eye itself. Okay, any of them. That's one of the experience, one of the things that was really odd. The other thing that was really odd about it was that um, they had these kids all sitting around this table with each one of them had a, uh, an adult standing next to them and they were teaching them to do this um, experiment it was a little game experiment thing and they had me do it and what i noticed was my mind slowed down so much because of all the dark forces in that room that i could barely think about anything i was like barely able to you know even think the, the tiniest thought, it was like my mind was being forced to be almost dead stop, you know. And so that was odd. And fortunately, a lady walked in the room and said, you're right, it's here, Mr. Beaver. <laughs> and I walked out. And uh, I got, that, that was my last, that was the last thing I remember in that uh, facility.
was be in the room with those insane children. And they were they were way worse off than anybody else in that facility. They were like the worst, you know. Because there's a difference between somebody who's sort of insane and somebody's fully, completely insane. There is a big difference. Mm. And uh, so anyway, uh, that's a good note to end this on. And uh, let me go ahead and uh, I want to thank you for being uh, with my audience today and talking about all your interesting experiences. And you'll have to, between now and the next, uh, you'll, you're going to have to come up with an idea of either do you want to have another conversation like this or do you want to get your missing time, which is more important to you, and choose whichever one you want to do next. And I'll let you decide which one you want and i thank you again for being on my show and uh it was fascinating and i'm sure i could get do many many of these and if you went into the weeds of all of your experiences i'm sure we could make a long series out of this yeah yep yeah i we yeah it, it's like swimming in this sea i just the, when i get asked so where do you want to tell what do you i'm like oh my god i'm swimming in the sea and i don't even know how to select one experience over it's almost like i need to be guided in questions like ask me anything and i can go diving for the answer for sure based on the experiences but when you've had so many experiences it, it's like this um array of like where do, what do i talk about first <laughs> All right, well, let me go ahead and stop the recording. Thank you again for being on my show. Thank you for having me. It was great. All right.